I now have the great pleasure of introducing Marshall Breeding, who's sitting to my right here. Marshall is a man who wears many hats. He's a, a writer, an editor, a speaker. Those of us who have been around for a while, um, I've spent a long time in the States, and I, I, I know Marshall from, I know his name, from the Library Technology Guides. He's probably most known for the Library Technology Guides and the online directory to, or to, to libraries. Um, as I said, he's worn many hats. He has visited Ireland previously for the Fourth International Symposium on Information Management. Um, he's currently, or he was, the co-chair of the National Information Standards Organization, which is the US National Information Standards Organization Open Discovery Initiative. He serves on the Open Discovery Initiative Standing Committee, and he's currently on the steering committee for an ESO initiative for consensus framework to support patron privacy in digital library and information systems, funded by the Mellon Foundation. He's going to talk to us about recent trends in library resource management and discovery technologies. And I will say that Marshall is someone who knows so much about library technology that what he doesn't know isn't worth knowing. So I give you Marshall Breeding. So it's great to be in Ireland again to talk to you about you know, my recent observations and research and so forth about the world of library technologies. Um, so you know, I, I, it's pretty easy to wrap a talk around the theme of the conference because you know, in the world of uh, library technology there is some revolutionary things going on where there's some kind of more, uh, more uh, you know, radical change and, but also there's a lot of evolution uh, I think that is both true of how libraries find themselves and, of course, the technology systems that we use. Now, why isn't this responding? Pressing the little thing, okay? That's just what's in the program. So Library Technology Guides is this website that I've been working on since, uh, I think, about 1997 and parts of it before that. Uh, so it's a resource that I, I hope you're aware of that, you know, I, I put information into this thing every day, one, one way or another. Uh, I have all these deadlines of reports and articles that I have to do, so uh, I work to have all this information at my own fingertips and design it in a way that it makes it available to the, the general library community as well. So I hope you will uh, find that useful. Uh, I don't know, uh, I, I built a page a couple of days ago on the libraries that are members of Connell and the, and the automation systems they use, or at least the ones that, that I'm aware that they use, so let me know if I'm wrong on any of that and keep me up to date, and it'll be interesting to see how that changes over the next few years. Okay. So I want to uh, kind of uh, gloss through a couple of the projects and reports that I've been working on and kind of highlight some information and findings of those that that I think are, are worth noting. There, there are kind of three big things that I do every year. Uh, well, not every year, uh, the middle one. Uh, so I've been doing this library systems report in one form or another since about 2002. It was published by Library Journal uh, from 2002 to 13 and the last couple of years for American libraries, just change of, of arrangement. Uh, and then these perception surveys are kind of interesting, I think, where I ask libraries what they think about the automation systems and their vendors and, and various questions about topics and that kind of thing. Um, and then related to the realm of discovery, I was commissioned to do this white paper for NISO uh, last year, and that's gotten quite a bit of attention. Uh, you know, I've, I've done several talks around that just in the last few days, have one planned for the upcoming uh, ALA conference, and we're going to do a standalone conference sponsored by NISO to talk about that. So the perception survey, uh, you know, before I say that, you know, it's interest. It's important, I think, to get information from lots of different directions. Uh, you know, a lot of it's data that you can just go out there and find. You know, what what are library, what automation systems is a library using? That's kind of an objective fact, and you know, you can just kind of build data around those kinds of, of, of data gathering exercises. Uh, you can talk to vendors about, well, what are your sales in a given year? What are the things you're working on? What have you done? Uh, that's kind of what the other report's about. Or you can ask libraries. You know, it's kind of subjective. Um, in a way, but you know, I also hope it's scientific in a way. 
So these perceptions reports are ones that I've been doing, uh, I think since about 2007, I'm not very good with years. Um, and I did this kind of with fear and trepidation because I'd seen some kind of ones that I didn't think were so good because they, they would have like 30 or 40 uh, you know, survey responses uh, upon which they make broad conclusions. Well, I get about 3,000 responses every year. And I'm able to kind of uh, segregate and aggregate them in ways that I think do a more fair treatment of what libraries think about their systems. Uh, where I can say, I can take all the ones of the large public academic, you know, libraries, for example, and, and look at some trends in large academics and so forth. So this year I got 3,141 responses from 80 different countries, so it's heavily weighted to the U.S., of course, because uh, that's where I am and people know me better there. But 80 countries, you know, at least had a few responses, so I hope that's useful. Uh, so it's a lot of data to work with and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the tables and charts, and I just want to show you a, a few samples of those. You saw on the previous slide the URL to get to it. It's easy to get to if you just go to my website. Uh, and so I've been working a lot with kind of the Google Visualization API in order to be able to take some of these, this data that I've been showing just in tables in previous years to start building some graphs and charts and that kind of thing to, to make a more of a visual impact. So, you know, this, this particular chart is just an example of some of the things that are in the, the report and it shows uh, the trends over time, and I've been doing this since 2007, of libraries using a given system reporting that they're interested in changing systems. Uh, so that can be both a good thing and a bad thing from a system vendor's point of view. If you're thinking of changing to that vendor's next system, that's kind of a good thing. Um, if you're thinking of changing to another system, well, they're probably not quite as happy about that. Uh, so it's interesting to see as new systems have kind of come into the marketplace that there certainly has been a lot of interest in, in libraries exploring, you know, moving to those systems. Uh, some, it's interesting to see that uh, some libraries running given systems have been less interested in changing than in times past, uh, though the level of interest in change is still pretty high. So uh, there's, there's tons of stuff like that. I could spend 20 minutes talking about kind of each slide. Uh, so I said that I uh, segregate the data into uh, kind of peer groups. Uh, this peer group are kind of large academic libraries. Uh, pick that one up because I think that would fit this crowd the best. Uh, and you can see the general satisfaction trends uh, over time. Um, these trends began in 2010 when I uh, had enough uh, data to be able to, uh, to, to separate it uh, in, in this way. <clears throat> so uh, you can see kind of rise and fall of different systems relative to the satisfaction level. Uh, and there's a lot more interesting ones too, so I would you know, again point you to the, to the report. Uh, this is just an example of the way that I gather and report the statistics, uh, where you know I don't reveal individual responses, but I do reveal the number of responses uh, in each of the ranges, so that other people can go back and and uh, and uh, do more statistical analysis as well. And then I just standard basic statistics uh, about that. Uh, and. Do I have the wrong one? Sorry, I redundant one. Uh, and, but you know, that's not the interesting part. The interesting part are the narrative comments. I got 900 almost, I think, comments. And you know, if you're basically okay with the system, you know, you just click through the, the numbers and, and, and give you a response. But if you're either highly satisfied or highly non-satisfied, then, then you'll take the time to write a response. So uh, that's where the real color of the report is, I think, uh, to go and read those. And you know, it's uh, anonymized in a way that I will uh, edit out you know, and show that I've edited uh, anything that identifies the institution or the individual. Uh, so only I know who made these comments, uh, nobody else. Uh, but I think that that they write these comments in order to kind of share that experience in kind of a more candid way as well. So uh, I think that's useful and, and, like, and, and provides kind of useful uh, background information, all to be taken with a grain of salt. I mean, that, you know, um, uh, 
uh, within any given library, you will have individuals that are highly positive and highly negative about the same system in the same circumstance. Um, the way I do the survey is that I only allow one response per library uh, and kind of urging that person responding to respond kind of on behalf of their organization. So, um, you know, that helps kind of uh, moderate out a little bit of the individual uh, and, you know, personal responses as opposed to institutional ones. Uh, so the other report I do every year uh, since 2002 is this library systems report. Uh, so this is kind of a broader industry report. What's the state of the industry? Um, and you know, what are the individual contributors of the industry, you know, the, the profit and the nonprofit commercial or, uh, you know, vendors that, that we spend money on on, on, on our systems? Um, so you know, I've been doing this uh, for, for quite a long time. I, there's a survey I send to the vendors that they respond to. Uh, where you know it asks a lot of statistics. Um, uh, you know, most are are pretty good about responding to that. There are categories of of questions that that some answer and some don't, especially those kind of regarding kind of financial uh, information and that kind of thing. But you know, it's a it's an important source. I think that the vendors are exceptionally candid about the performance of their business given that these are all private organizations with no obligation to make public reporting in the way that you know, public companies are. So you know, I'm delighted that they're willing to share some of that information with me. Uh, and of course, then I take all the other information I know about the companies and their press releases and the, the, you know, the things in my database and so forth to be able to kind of produce a comprehensive report. Uh, and, you know, this is why I think it's important in this slide here. Libraries in aggregate spend something under $2 billion annually in these kinds of technology products. So, you know, it's important that somebody be kind of looking over their shoulder and uh, reporting how they're doing and what the winners and the losers are and, and kind of what, what are the, the you know, what are the performance of the companies and kind of what's the background and, and the development and the trends and all that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, th this is sizable about an investment that, that we all have at stake. Uh, again, this is just an example. One of the things that I count that I can more publicly show is the, the number of individuals that work for each of the companies. Uh, I think this is an important statistic, especially it does two things. One is kind of it, it, it kind of lets you kind of line up the size of the companies, and you can see that we have some pretty big players in the industry, uh, and that some of the players in the library technology industry aren't ones that we've talked a lot about in the past. You know, they've been kind of the content companies, and but there are more and more of those are getting involved in, in producing the discovery and resource management product technologies that we use as well. So they've kind of come into my fold as well as the ones that I watch and report on. Uh, and then within those larger numbers, you know, how much are they investing in development? Because uh, I think that really speaks to their capacity to produce innovation. And you know, you can see some interesting numbers that uh, you know, some with you know almost two two hundred or more developers. You know, that that's a sizable development team. That's what it takes to develop systems of the of the the level that we expect and, and that we need. Um, and then you can see some much more modest numbers where I worry that some of the organizations developing technology might be under-resourced. And of course, you can watch those over time and see the rise and fall of, of the different companies. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about some of these technology products themselves. Uh, when I look at academic and research libraries especially, and this happens with others as well, it's amazing kind of the pieces and parts that are in play in order to let you do what you do. Uh, a very fragmented approach to uh, managing resources and automating your operations. Uh, and I worry about that. How, ma you know, how much does it take in order to be able to uh, run your library? You have uh, your uh, resource management system, library management system, discovery services, electronic resource management system, scheduling software, uh, link resolvers, knowledge bases, you know, um, you know, authentication systems, proxy systems, all of these that are just kind of uh, implemented 
uh, individually and they don't really talk to each other very well. They all take a lot of time to kind of uh, install and maintain and configure. Uh, other than that, it's a perfectly fine arrangement. Uh, you know, I don't think it's a very fine arrangement at all, actually. You know, I think that uh, this has been a historical evolution of technologies that nobody would invent if they were to say, well, how would you automate a library today? Uh, you know, it had to do a lot with kind of the basic shape of the library management system as it emerged out of the, the 60s and 70s and kind of got solidified into certain modules. Uh, and then when, it, when the libraries changed, they didn't. Uh, you know, academic libraries in general uh, spend the vast majority of their collection budgets on electronic resources, and these library management systems were designed around managing print inventories. So we've had to build a lot of pieces and parts around the edges in order to be able to meet that gap. So how do you, so how do you kind of uh, break out of this fragmentation? Uh, you know, we, we've seen it happen a few times before. Uh, you know, the library management systems, they kind of gel together out of separate acquisitions and circulation systems and all those kinds of different parts that were uh, created first into an integrated library system, as we call them in the U.S., or library management systems, as they're called here. So that was kind of one phase of bringing things together, and I think we're in another phase of it now. How do you take a lot of these standalone uh, technology utilities and systems and platforms and databases and start uh, bringing them together in a way that really works together for the benefit of the library more efficiently with kind of less technical overhead. You know, systems librarians have a lot to do and you know, we make them do, spin their wheels a lot uh, relative to babysitting all these different systems. So I, I think that there's a need uh, to kind of to more uh, have a more comprehensive approach to resource management. I have a couple of pictures that illustrate the point a bit, where you know this is kind of the shape internally of integrated library systems, a lot of data stores and business logic interfaces with very complicated relations among all of them, and it can be kind of dizzying to, to think about that. So as academic libraries became involved in electronic resources, well, what's the natural thing to do? You spin off a new electronic resource management system that manages a lot of the same data on a different and separate platform. Um, you know, you have the same vendors, you have the same bibliographic database, but now you have licenses and those kinds of things. So there's a lot of redundancy and replication when it comes to having separate electronic resource management and no good way for those systems to talk to each other. Uh, NISO came up with this core specification protocol for them to talk to each other. There was never a single implementation of that. Uh, I think. Uh, what was wrong was the idea of managing print electronic resources separately. Uh, you know, that was just kind of a hard arrangement. So this is what a lot of libraries that I'm aware of do, is they have all of these informal systems. They have the secret databases and spreadsheets that manage the licenses and the spend and the, the list of titles and all those kind of things that sit in somebody's computer. So in a way, you're using informal management uh, of the majority of your capital, you know, of your annual expenditures. So this this doesn't seem like a very good uh, approach to me, but it's a very common one. Uh, so how can we start bringing all of the uh, resource management uh, across formats and you know into a more organized way? So. Uh, well, s some of that. And the thing that I notice, even in the systems that are available today, this next phase of, of, of systems, is that there's still amazing gaps in, the, in the, the realm of library automation from my point of view. Uh, it's all targeted mostly on the back of the library, technical services and, and so forth. How do you, how do you select and, and pay for things? And not so much on the provision of service. Uh, you know, most Commercial organizations would have a, um, a customer relationship management system that helps them, um, you know, shape, monitor, and analyze the way that they perform service to their customers. And libraries kind of still do tick marks at the reference desk. So I think that we need to get a lot more advanced in managing the way that we provide kind of public-facing services. So I'm not seeing a lot of that quite yet. 
Uh, I think the tools available for interlibrary loan are, are very kind of separate and, and weak compared to those that we use to manage and build our collections. Uh, so I'd like to see some improvements in that. Uh, special collections and archives, that there's actually some decent tools out there for doing that, but again, they're quite separate from the library management systems. So I see that organizations that have both archives and libraries often are pretty uh, bifurcated in the way that they manage those two collections. Sometimes you can bring them together on discovery, but there's not a very unified management approach to them. So I think that's the trend that we see today, are trying to bring you know, some subset of these things together. And the different products that are emerging do it in different ways, but I think that's a common thing, that, that libraries aren't as tolerant of these different isolated and uh, applications that don't talk to each other, but there's more of a demand for systems that actually work together well, uh, designed to work together. Uh, so as these systems uh, began coming out, you know, I didn't want to keep calling them library management systems or integrated library systems. Uh, so I kind of came up with the term library services platform as a new genre of software that describes uh, these new systems that approach library management in a pretty different way. You know, they're still library specific, um, but you know, they're you know they're different. They're they're based on a services-oriented architecture, they expose web services and APIs, they help libraries uh, perform their services, so I kind of like that word, and their platforms uh, that you can write code against and be able to write additional applications. On a functional level, uh, when I look at most of them, the basic concept is that they be able to manage both print and electronic resources within the same kind of engine, the same platform. Uh, to replace multiple incumbent products. So, you know, again, it kind of consolidates the number of, of fragmented parts that you have uh, in, in your environment. They're flexible about metadata. It, they're not just built around Mark. Um, you know, you, you can't hardwire any metadata format into a system these days. You can't hardwire any kind of uh, business logic into systems these days. It's too much in motion. So all of these have to be built to be flexible metadata management and business systems for libraries, uh, given the, the rapid change uh, that we're seeing in all of these areas. Uh, you know, especially now where we're facing changes in fundamental metadata management, uh, mo you know, where we're thinking about what will follow Mark 21. You know, conversations about bib frame and open link data. Uh, the uh, pre-existing need to be able to manage lots of different uh, XML-oriented formats, Dublin Core, MED, you know, mods, and, and all of these kind, kind of the formats. So the world, unlike the 1960s, is not revolving around Mark so much anymore, so our systems can't be either. So they can populate with knowledge bases. Uh, so that you know you don't have to, is, you can move a little bit away from the you know one by one kind of uh, resource description. You know when you get a collection of thirty thousand ebooks, you're not going to be able to uh, catalog those individually. How can you manage metadata in you know in mass you know uh, at volume? So we've got to have better tools for being able to do that, while at the same time being able to maintain the quality of metadata that our professionals and our customers expect. Uh, got to have built-in analytics so that you know you know what you're doing. You can measure the performance of your collection. Uh, you, you know what to buy, what to not buy. Uh, you know how the collection is being accessed by your communities. So it's all about analytics. You got to be able to measure in order to be able to spend your scarce resources both for collections and people in the smartest possible ways. So I'm going to breeze through a lot of these, and I'm going to run out of time. Got a lot of slides left. So uh, I'm not going to say everything on every slide, uh, but here it's important to say that many of these systems come populated with knowledge bases that power the system. In a way, it's not enough just to build technology. You know, it's not about coding. It's about how you can uh, have up-to-date, current, uh, and high-quality knowledge bases that describe bodies of content and metadata that will give you a big jump start into describing and managing your collections. So you see that expressed in different ways uh, and by the different kind of major systems out there. Um, you know, some 
that don't populate their own knowledge bases or licensing others, but in a, you know, especially in the realm of electronic resource management, we've been used to the idea of knowledge bases that power link resolvers for a while anyway. So it's kind of getting deeper into the, the model of how libraries manage their collections. I've already mentioned BibFrame. If you're not part of that conversation, I uh, urge you to listen in because it's going to be probably a bigger change in the realm of metadata management than any of us have seen before. Uh, to, to say that we're moving away from Mark 21 is not a small deal, but not to dwell on that now. Um, so, you know, th these are a different, th these are systems that are deployed in a different kind of way as well. You don't have a server that's sitting in your library in most cases. Uh, you know, these are deployed in the same way that familiar tools like Facebook and Gmail are. They exist in clusters of servers out there in data centers that you will never see delivering services that you get access to via subscription to be able to uh, use the functionality that they have for, for your library. Uh, these global platforms, these multi-tenant systems, have the ability, kind of just like Gmail, to be able to uh, segregate data so you can't read each other's mail, so that you, know, you have your library's collection and not your neighbor's, and they have ways to aggregate data so that you have shared knowledge bases and, and that kind of thing. So this is the way that the business world has been building and using software for a long time now. You look at, at um, things like salesforce.com, you know, this has kind of been the business engine that competing companies use to manage their, their sales and, their, and the delivery of their service for a long time. So this isn't new, it's not library specific, it's the way that you do things these days. Client server computing where you have installable clients on the desktop and servers that run the, the software are, you know, nobody does it that way as far as new systems. Uh, the, you know, it's a transition away from that, but you know, we're long past the time of that model of client server computing. So, you know, uh, the, the library world as usual, you know, is a little bit, you know, behind certain business sectors in that transition, but that's, that's the way the world is moving and I'm glad to see the library moving that well, way as well. So, uh, when I talk about bringing a lot of systems together, what I'm also not talking about are monolithic systems that do everything. You know, where you just buy the one thing and, and you turn it on and it does everything for your library, there still continues to be a lot of differentiation in libraries and what they need to have done. And the reality that library systems need to interoperate to communicate with a lot of different systems on your campuses uh, and your broader organizations. Uh, authentication is uh, an example of that. You know, most universities live in an environment where authentication is provided as a campus-wide service, so you don't want to have to manage that within your library management system. You want to be able to tap into the institutional system. You need to be able to not wholly manage finances within your acquisitions module like the LMS does, but rather you need to be able to interoperate with the institutions uh, ERP systems, enterprise resource planning systems, uh, so that you're uh, communicating fi financial data with the systems of record for your institutions. Uh, in other words, there may be more and more opportunities for libraries not to redundantly manage information that is also managed elsewhere in the institution. So I think, it's, I think we need those kind of efficiencies. And we'll have other pieces within our own uh, within our own library organizations, like you know, um, uh, you know, self-check systems and all of those. So these systems have to be built from the ground up to be interoperable and to be able to communicate with a variety of systems. And then, from a user point of view, we need to get away from the current reality, which is a website full of handoffs, where you know you go to the website, you go into the catalog, you're in a different world. You know, you go into the interlibrary loan request system, you're in a different world. So it's all just a system of jarring handoffs from, from one uh, application to another because they happen to have different back-end systems that you use for those. Those different back-end systems should be invisible. You know, with the technologies available today, through web services and APIs, it's possible to construct this kind of presentation layer approach that has a seamless 
interface with kind of your branding and presentation and all of you know those cosmetic and, and presentational styles that communicate with a variety of back-end systems that do the heavy lifting. It's, uh, you know, it, it, uh, you know, I think I don't think our community members understand where they are sometimes when they're using uh, library services because they all look and act so so differently. So it, let's try to bring those together. Um, so a lot of what I talk about are the kind of the different new platforms that are out there. Uh, we talk just mention the different uh, products that fall into this library services platform. Uh, category, genre that I talk about, and you, you can see that there are kind of four of them that uh, institutions could go and buy today, and one that will be available pretty soon from, from ProQuest. Um, the, the last uh, library systems report that I wrote, you know, it, its subtitle was a maturing genre of systems. Uh, the point that I want to make with that is that you know, how, how long are we going to play wait and see and let's see what, what eventually comes out? These systems have been used in production since 2011, uh, for some of them in 2012 for the others. Uh, and, you know, how long are we going to use systems that are clearly not operating uh, to the, the needs of, of libraries to kind of wait and see what eventually might happen, what even, you know, the systems that might mature? So, you know, I think the cards are mostly on the table now and libraries can begin to evaluate and, 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 and think about what their next phase is. And, and many are, of course. Many of you are, uh, have already moved in, to new systems. But when I look around the library world in general, it's a lot of what let's wait and see. And that's frustrating to me because I see people sitting on systems long past the time that, that they serve them well. So you know, technology should help libraries do what they do in a better kind of way. And I worry that some libraries use, you know, their technology systems are more like making them swim upstream instead of helping them, you know, sail down, you know, the, the, the right path. Uh, so I also want to say that, you know, uh, there, there are other systems around besides these that I just mentioned. Library management systems continue to exist and will prosper uh, for a long time. Um, and especially when I speak to uh, those from public libraries, I, I'm careful to say that being a library services platform isn't a value judgment. That, you know, there are library management systems that are well suited public libraries that are still mostly about managing print, you know, physical inventories, which is what they do. Uh, when, when you have to circulate, you know, 20 or 30,000 transactions a year, you want systems that are optimized to do that. What you don't need is a system that's optimized to manage, you know, very large multi-million dollar collections of electronic resources at the article level. So the business problems differ, and so therefore it's expected to see different kinds of systems out there, some that have more directly evolved from the library management system, and some that are entirely different. This slide here kind of points out the uh, revolution versus uh, evolution approach to at least the library services arena, where you know this kind of lays out the timelines of development uh, to production, you know, of these different systems. How long are they in development, and when do they start putting the the first libraries in production? And you can see the ones that kind of start from scratch are the ones that take longer in development. That's not surprising. The organizations that have the larger development capacity can get it done faster. Uh, the ones that evolve their existing systems can collapse this considerably. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the one in that category is Innovative Sierra. They use a lot of the business logic wrapped around new technologies, so in a way they didn't start from scratch in a way that some of the others did. So it's a, it, you know, uh, you, you can see it's been a successful approach as libraries kind of vote with their pocketbooks. You know, they have 495, I can't quite read the number from here, in production at the end of last year. So, you know, th there's, uh, you know, all of these are successful models. So, you know, I don't, again, it's not a value judgment to say whether a system has gotten to where it is through evolution or revolution. I think it's more important to look at how well they're matched between library business problems and, and the system and, and, and the shape of the system. Uh, and again, this shows that the, the number of installations of these systems uh, you know, you're not really going out there alone for some of these. There are hundreds of libraries using these systems in production. 
So, you know, I'm just kind of uh, uh, reinforce that point. So we're in a cycle now that I think, oh, and, and these are 10 year cycles, you know, the, the, the phase of going from mainframe computers to, to client server uh, systems was about 10 or 15 years. Uh, getting out of the client server arena to this new generation of web-based platforms is going to be about 10 years. So we're a couple of three years into that, but I think that, it, you know, as we're half or two thirds of the way into that, uh, the, the systems that are mostly used in libraries will be of this new slate and not the old roster. So, you know, that's kind of where we are, that, you know, um, we don't expect you know, there, there's some libraries that are able and willing to kind of go in early and, and have business needs and have the level of tolerance for risk that they can kind of go in early and kind of help shape the systems as they are still in these early phases. Others, you know, want systems that they can kind of use more uh, directly and with, with less risk and so forth. But now we're in, for some of the systems, a pretty routine sales implementation and uh, cycle. A tricky part of the industry today is uh, discovery versus resource management. Are, should they be from the same package? Can you go a la carte on these? Uh, and again, there are different scenarios kind of based on the, the, the vendor products and the preferences of libraries. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's more complicated now, I think, than it has been in the past, where we talked earlier about knowledge bases, and that kind of ties, you know, it, you know, discovery services are based on them, resource management systems are based on them, so if you get those from different providers, then you have to deal with, well, how are the knowledge bases going to, to work together? So it's not just a technology decision, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a metadata management issue as well. How are you going to get everything in sync and keep it up to date? Uh, so the model of discovery that's prevalent now is this uh, index-based discovery, where in times past, it wasn't really practical to think that you could do article level journal indexing. Uh, I know at Vanderbilt we were we made a stab at that in the 1980s. Uh, part of our notice implementation, we had this project called MDAS, Multiple Database and Access System, where we were loading tapes of Wilson article metadata into our system, and you know that it was a, a, a very difficult. Uh, and time-intensive process, and we, we did that for a number of years. Um, and today, you know, it, this, it's even harder when, you know, the amount of uh, material is, is so much more, and we expect the article level and full text. The size of these consolidated indexes is in the multiple billions by now. So, you know, the, but the technology can easily do that. You know, used to say, well, it's a million uh, mark records and can we find a system that can manage that for us? And now, you know, mark records are nothing, they, they're tiny. Uh, and then, uh, you know, tens of millions, you know, WorldCat has hundreds of millions, so, you know, that's not, 100 million mark records is no big deal. Uh, a billion full text uh, article records is no big deal. It's well within the scope of the technologies these days. Google, Facebook, you know, that they would laugh at that. You know, a billion, what you, you know, I, I, I ate a billion records for lunch, they would say. Uh, so the scale of the technology and the sophistication of the index systems are kind of uh, well able to manage an index that has the entirety of the universe of content that are of interest to libraries. Well, this, just the beginning of the story though. So how do you do that in a way that libraries, librarians and library users will like? Uh, how do you do relevancy uh, in a way that shows the most important uh, items first uh, that a librarian would uh, agree with and that a user would find helpful? So, you know, it's very complicated and that's where the state of the art is being worked out now is kind of better relevancy for different library scenarios such as, you know, I think academic is kind of its own uh, scenario in itself. How, how do you tune them up to show the, the most academically and scholarly uh, materials first? You know, doing things like showing primary works before derivative ones and all those kind of things. It's really hard. But that, that's what the developers of these index-based discovery systems are, are working on. 
and then also to be able to fill in the gaps. Once you get into this model, you expect them to index everything that you have, and it's annoying when they don't. It's more than annoying. It's disruptive, it's damaging. So I think that, again, is part of the industry that's being worked out now, is how to get more universal participation of all the content providers uh, into the realm of index-based discovery. So there's a lot of conversations, uh, to put it mildly, uh, more arguments and loggerheads and all those kinds of things that are going on, but I'm hopeful that there will be resolution to those, and that's part of the, what I think is important about the Open Discovery Initiative, is to facilitate better participation by all kinds of content providers into these discovery systems. Again, working toward a comprehensive approach to the uh, library user, where you know they, you know we, we hide all the details and, and the complications and the different systems, the different publishers, in ways that they can simply access the the content and the services that we provide in the way that they want to, knowing that that is mostly mobile these days. If all of your systems don't work well on a mobile phone, they might as well. You know, I mean, it's just hopeless. You know, you, um, most use comes from mobile devices these days. I know that from my own website and and so forth. A little bit different in the library space. You know, a a student is isn't going to write their paper based on their iPhone. Well, but they might. Uh, they they certainly will from their tablet. So, uh, mobile first, responsive. Uh, uh, design in all of your websites and business applications is just critical these days. So, so these are the, the system, system sales out there. EBSCO is pretty far ahead right now, uh, followed by Ex Libris. Uh, um, WorldCat Discovery is harder to manage because this counts their first subscription, so it's kind of hard to count. Uh, imagine a sys library management system without a catalog. That might be the next phase of things, you know? So, uh, you know, discovery layers that adequately manage the scope that we got used to in online catalogs that, you know, where their scope was the, the local inventory that you had on your shelves, not intermixed with all the articles that you provide access to. So how, how do you also have a scoped view of discovery layer that, that is satisfying in that way? So I think that's part of what is uh, expected now and becoming you know, demanded by libraries as they move to these discovery systems because at some point they're gonna have to replace some of the, the local catalogs. Lots of different ways to do that. Uh, again, I don't want to, to read all of this, but you know, there are different approaches you can have uh, you know, you can take the package offered by a given vendor, you can take an open source solution and build a bento box approach where you're blending uh, results from different uh, content sources, uh, or you can mix and match uh, between discovery services from one provider and a resource management from another. But keep in mind, once you kind of get out of the bundle package, you become the integrator. Uh, you know, that, uh, and, and this is kind of difficult stuff. The light's changing already, I'm gonna have to stop faster. Uh, so I'm gonna skip some of this, because I want, what I want to get to, what I think is important, is the resource sharing scenarios. And I think that's a particular interest here, is that uh, one of the major things that's happening in the world of library technology is the idea of every library managing uh, everything in isolation is, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of other options. That if you want to have strategic cooperation, then it's important to have technology that f facilitates that. So every library having independent silos of resource management uh, can be a hindrance to things like collaborative collection development, collaborative resource sharing, and there are a lot of examples where libraries have banded together to do a unified system because they found the idea of having separate library management systems to be the major hindrance to their ability to be able to strategically share their people and collections. Um, so that you, you see more exam lots of examples about that. The one that's gotten the most press recently is the Orvis Cascade Alliance. Uh, where uh, this is 37 uh, institutions, private, public, large, small, across three different states uh, that you know, have been working together for a long time and they found the idea of separate library management systems a hindrance to their commitment to uh, strategic resource uh, sharing and so in collaboration, so they opted to go for a single system. 
So I think it's kind of a good test case, a good pioneering case that lots of other organizations have looked to as a, as a way to do that. We're certainly used to the idea of having lots of different branches managed within a single library management system. Uh, this has been kind of the state of the art of resource sharing where you have some kind of resource sharing middleware that might provide a union catalog and schleps transactions from one library to another so that one uh, patron at one library can borrow materials in the other, usually in an unmediated way. But you can see it's very complicated and I don't think it's that scalable and, it, and it, these can be fragile. So rather, you know, you can use what's kind of built into the fundamentals of library management systems and, and, and library services platforms to be able to treat all of the different libraries and their uh, constituent branches is kind of a big system. The system know how to do this, so you can easily do, uh, you know, requests across these different institutional borders in, in, in a different kind of way. So, you know, this is one of the models that's in play now. The Wealth Consortia, it, this is what they've opted for as well. All, all the academic libraries in Wales are, are committed toward moving to the, this kind of system as well. So, you know, whether you're a large library system, a more informal group of libraries, there are, you know, this seems to be one of the models of library management uh, that is in play under consideration, uh, which offers some opportunities that I think are important. Uh, you know, I worked with the two cool organizations, Cornell and Columbia, and their main driver was to be able to do some sharing of expertise and technical services. You know, why should both organizations have this, you know, each have to have their African studies cataloger that, that can describe materials in Swahili? Uh, you know, those are resources that should be shared, where specialists in each organization might be able to uh, contribute, you know, across the broader organization. So that, you know, that's just you know, lots of libraries will continue to automate individually, uh, and you know, but I think more will choose these these shared arrangements as well. See the little red light here. I think that means I need to stop now. There, there's some other slides. Uh, they're available on my website, uh, and they mo mostly talk about some of the specific implementations of this. But you know, I've really gotten to what I wanted to, to say today. So hopefully, I have time for some questions. So well, th thank you for that, and I invite your questions. <laughs>